I would argue, in fact, that covenants demand more of us than any creed ever could. This past June, our annual Unitarian Universalist Association General Assembly delegates voted to move ahead with proposed changes to Article 2 of the Unitarian Universalist Association bylaws by a vote of 1,816 to 289. Several amendments were proposed and submitted to GA in the Article 2 Commission, and some were amended, some were passed, and some were not approved. If the proposal is passed by a two-thirds majority of delegates at next spring's General Assembly, our Article 2 and our bylaws will be revised. Now, bylaws are very dry and not the most of spiritual things sometimes, but this is where we host in our denomination, our association, our mission, our principles, our purposes. This is the place where currently you will find as written, I think, on the back of your order of service here, the seven principles. These would be replaced with a new approach should the Article II revision pass with its two-thirds majority. The new proposal is based on a language of values and covenants, promises, we make to each other about how to live out the values. This month, I'm focusing on heritage, and because a major piece of our heritage as Unitarian Universalists is undergoing a change process in real time, I thought it might be a good opportunity to just poke in on where that process is at and reflect on it a little bit. How many of you knew this process was going on? Okay, excellent. Okay, great. How many of you have not heard of this at all? All right, fair enough. There has been a lot of debate and discussion about this proposed change. And we are entering into another year of debate and discussion <laughs> about this proposed change. I will admit that I personally love the new approach and I know others do not. I understand the very real emotional attachment many Unitarian Universalists have to the seven principles. And yet at the same time I hold that, I also have to admit I find it personally just a little odd that we are very explicit about doing a review of a statement about who we are every 15 years. And it seems rather strange to me to dig in one's heels against a change brought about by a mandated periodic review in a religious tradition that stipulates, above anything else, we have no dogma or creed. So that change is always an ongoing process. But as they say, culture eats strategy and sometimes logic for breakfast. And the culture of the seven principles in our tradition is very strong at this point. I think one of the reasons the seven principles have become so beloved among us is that it offers individual Unitarian Universalists a concise summary of our own worldview. And yet one of the big misunderstandings about Article 2 and our bylaws which is where the seven principles are, is that it's pointed at individual Unitarian Universalists as a way to summarize what we believe. Article two of our bylaws is the covenant that congregations make with each other to be part of the association. And by extension, a lot of us have adopted those seven principles as a way to explain what we believe and what our tradition kind of believes and holds as our central values. But it's important to remember that where this is placed in our tradition is actually a covenant, not between individual Unitarian Universalists, 
but between our congregations with each other to form an association. And covenant is a word we use a lot in Unitarian Universalism. I bet you've heard it a lot already this morning. And yet for all the importance it's granted in our tradition, we don't really talk about it all that often, nor do we explain what it is or how it makes us different. Quite often, especially as adult Unitarian Universalists, when we talk about covenant, we're actually talking about making rules of behavior. But a covenant isn't about rules of behavior, such as a committee covenant to show up for meetings on time. Start on time, respect everybody in the group. That's not necessarily a covenant, it's a contract for basic mature behavior. A covenant is about what moves us, what values motivate us and give us life and animate us. So much so that we promise to each other to make them the way we relate to each other in the world. About 10 years ago, my friend and colleague Tom Below published an essay about an experience he had as a minister while he was in Kansas. He attended an event where people were protesting a Missouri law that would restrict science-based human sexuality education. And word got out that a pastor was on the pro-sex education side at the protest. Oh, many people there, including many media members, approached him, and everybody had a very difficult time understanding what he was about and what our tradition was about. He says, I explained that we are a covenantal faith, not a creedal faith. We share a covenant of how we try to be together, not a creed of what we almost believe together. And the questions were thrown at him. Well, what do you believe about the Bible? And he answered, that's a creedal question. We are a covenantal faith. We share a covenant about how to be together, not what we're expected to believe together. Well, what do you believe about God, they asked. And I told them, that's a creedal question. We are a covenantal church. We share a covenant of how we're going to be together, not what we're expected to believe altogether. He says, this went on for a while, an interminable while. It took them a long time to get it, and some of them still didn't. They were being challenged to think about faith in a brand new way. He says, and I agree, that, quote, sometimes in our churches, we stress the fact that we are not a creedal church more than the fact that we stress we are a covenantal church. We emphasize the creeds we're asked not to believe in or recite more than the covenants we are asked to share. We overemphasize the fact that we are not necessarily required to believe in something, but we underemphasize the covenantal dimensions of a shared faith community, preferring not to articulate the covenants that bind us. I think we do this because covenants require something of us. And many people arrive at Unitarian Universalism thinking erroneously that we can believe whatever we want here and that no demands are made on us in order to be part of the community. That's not true. I would argue, in fact, that covenants demand more of us than any creed ever could. Creeds are either or, binary, yes, no, you're in or you're out, you agree or you don't. In a way, it's really simplistic. Covenants are much more complicated. Covenants are promises that go to the heart of belonging to others. They're vows, like wedding vows. In the reading this morning, Paul Palmer gives a great explanation of why a covenant is different from a contract and how covenants are promises. 
and in so promises are more powerful in binding us together and at the same time more painful, much more painful when they're broken and ignored and violated. Covenants cannot be broken, but if violated, they result in personal loss and broken hearts. And the loss that they deal in is primarily a loss of trust. And another way to look at trust is faith. We lose faith in each other when we break our promises to each other. And this is why covenants are much harder than creeds. Because part of our promise is that when we break the promise, we violate the promise. We also promise to make it right again. Because you know what? We're all going to break our promises at some point, some way, whether we intend to or not, whether we thought we did or not, whether we were aware of it or not. And then we have the much harder job of reconciliation, of making good with one another. And it's assumed that if we are promising relationship to each other, based in certain values, anything that damages that is going to hurt a lot. And it's going to take a lot of work to restore the bond that once was before that trust, that faith in the other, got damaged in some way. Oh, those creedal churches up and down the street, they got it easy. <laughs> they're in or they're out. We're stuck in in-between working at relationship every day all the time. And I'd much rather do it that way. I find it much more meaningful. And it can get really difficult. I think we lose sight sometimes of how important belonging and covenant and promise are because so many of us come to Unitarian Universalism from places where we did not fit in theologically, philosophically, politically, culturally, you name it. And here, we do our very best to make room for you as you are. And that means we're going to have a lot of different ways of looking at the world together in one community. But what a glorious, glorious experiment we are involved in to create a religious tradition that is, in a sense, just a microcosm of what the world's got to ultimately figure out how we in all our difference have to love each other, have to get along with each other because it's the only way we survive together. The covenant that binds our congregations to each other in our Unitarian Universalist Association bylaws goes back to the original bylaws of 1961 when the American Unitarian Association and the Universalist Church of America consolidated. What we've come to know as the seven principles were not present in those original bylaws. The principles and sources are only 40 years old. The most recent major change was in the 1980s with the addition of a sixth source in the 1990s. Major developments in our tradition since the 1990s, I think, are having a profound influence on this revisioning process of our covenant that we're undertaking. One of the things I notice, and I find it a bit significant, is in our tradition there was this old infighting between people who believed in God and people who didn't. And my experience as a minister is that a lot of this has calmed down. It's not such a big conflict, so overt anymore. And I help, I think that's helped along by a, a demographic shift 
my own personal experience has been that Unitarian Universalists who are my age, mid upper 50s or younger, are far less concerned with that, do you believe in God, are you an atheist thing, than Unitarian Universalists who are older than I am. And part of the reason I think that generational shift has happened is because I think my generation, the generations after me in this tradition, find that type of quarrel antithetical to what this whole tradition is supposed to be about, where people from different ways of seeing things are supposed to be together. For most of the 1970s, 80s, into the 90s, Unitarian Universalism existed as much, maybe if not more so, as a reaction against religions people ran away from, as was being something forward thinking that we created together in covenant to go into the future. When the seven principles entered our UU bylaws back in the 1980s, you probably couldn't find a congregation in your local zip code other than Unitarian Universalist that was feminist, environmentalist, queer, concerned with civil rights and economic and environmental justice. And this is no longer true. You can march across the street and find people in the Methodist church concerned with all those things. It's one of the reasons we as a denomination haven't grown a heck of a lot is because you no longer need to stop being a Lutheran or an Episcopalian or a Methodist or a Congregationalist or a Presbyterian to be liberal. My wife is an Episcopal priest. The president of her congregation is a lesbian. <laughs> the Episcopal Bishop of Connecticut is a gay man. She's on a working group of environmental justice. I mean, it, it's changed. The religious world has changed. It's now between people who are fundamentalists, my way or the highway religiously, and people who are not, whatever their preferred allegiance or where they feel they fit theologically or in terms of all the big questions. Other traditions have liberalized a great deal. At the turn of the 21st century, 20-ish years ago, the then UU president, Reverend Bill Sinkford, challenged us to reclaim what he called a language of reverence, and by which he meant overtly religious language. Terms such as spirit, God, faith, religion, terms that let the public know there are religious people on the side of inclusion and tolerance and democracy and civil rights and reproductive rights and the whole scope of it. And part of the reason I think he felt that was so necessary is that for a couple generations, the left had abandoned religious language and ways of arguing their message in the public square. Martin Luther King did not shy away at all from quoting the prophets in his public speeches about civil rights. But you go find somebody on the side of inclusion and equity today who's quoting the Psalms of the prophets and public pronouncements. Doesn't happen much anymore. And we still live in a culture where that carries a lot of weight and how we interpret it and how we see it and how we communicate about it still matters. It's like, well, we can't win the game because we've quit playing. And our way of looking, I, I'm, I happen to believe some ways of believing are better than others. There are some ways of believing that hurt people and hate people and harm people. And we need to be able to articulate the way of believing that includes and loves, as a love of Unitarian Universalists would do, in defense against all that. I think the current draft of our Article 2, this new way of looking at covenant, shows a willingness to think beyond just having an eighth principle about racial justice, which is great, but trying to put that across all our values, that it, it, does, it doesn't have to be separated. It's supposed to be part of every other thing. 
part of what I love about this new way of imagining our central values is it's circular. It's got a center of love. And all these things are equal and interdependent as a network of values that reinforce and make each other. Love becomes centralized. I happen to really like that. It fits in with our universalist tradition, who in all their statements of faith and what they were about, always centered love and that God was love. So it plays off our tradition going into our universalist side and heritage. And, you know, when the side with love, as we call our justice campaigns in Unitarian Universalism, debuted the yellow shirts. I hated those things. Like, seriously, you had to pick that color? Oh, that's awful. Why not the monkey puke neon green that's on other stuff? I'm like, really? But that was just my personal preference. I know. But I came to love it. Love it. I changed because of how effective those dang yellow shirts became. Because our community partners recognized we were there when the yellow was there. They called us, and my friend, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, who has just left the presidency of the UUA, um, when she was doing her work protesting Sheriff Joe Arpaio and all the immigration stuff going on in Arizona, that the coalition partners there when we showed up called us the love people. <laughs> Damn, those yellow shirts are going to make me fall in love with them yet. The center being love the enduring force that holds us together. Love inspires and powers the passion with which we embody the rest of our values. And we list the other values, naming them and describing what living out a covenant, a promise, steeped in each of those values looks like. So it's value, covenant about the value, value, covenant about the value, value, covenant about the value. It takes the affirmation to respect the dignity and worth of every person and spreads the dignity and worth and respect throughout all the values, proclaiming, we declare that every person has the right to flourish with dignity and worthiness. Flourish is a great word. Each person not only deserves dignity and respect, but the dignity and respect must go beyond tolerance Tolerance is not a great goal. It just means you're okay with leaving that alone. Inclusion is a much better goal. Beyond tolerance and survival into being able to enjoy the fullness of being human and the fullness of life. What good is dignity and respect if you're still left out of enjoying everything life has to offer as a human being? My first read through the new draft when it was first put out instantly brought to mind to me with this focus on love, one of my favorite theological treatments about the value of love. And this has been a favor of mine long before I met my wife. It's from Episcopalian priest and theologian, Isabel Carter Haywood from her book, We Pledge Our Hearts. She says, we are not automatic lovers of self, others, the world, or God. Love does not just happen. We are not love machines puppets on the strings of a deity called love. Love is a choice, and not simply or necessarily a rational choice, but rather a willingness to be present to others without pretense or guile. Love is a conversion to humanity, a willingness to participate with others in the healing of a broken world and broken lives. Love is the choice to experience life as a member of the human family, a partner in the dance of life, rather than as an alien in the world or as a deity above it, aloof and apart from human flesh. Still my favorite treatment of love is a theological value I've ever read. 
for traditions such as ours that can lose itself in over intellectualization and become a debating society of Unitarian Universalists, having a core central value of love, something that's both easy to define and yet mysteriously difficult to parse and explain, I think is wonderful. The focus on love builds in deep connections to our universalist roots, just as the present version of our principles is steeped in our Unitarian heritage. Focusing on love as that most holy of values. Carter Haywood and James Luther Adams say, together they hold this idea that love doesn't just pops up deus ex machina. It's a choice. And we must bring it into being, love it into being, in covenant, together. Thanks a lot for watching this video. It would help me out a great deal if you liked the video, to give it a big thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, share this video with others, maybe ring that notification bell so you can be informed when we put out other videos like this. Check out my website and blog at TonyLorenzen.com for even more resources that will open your mind, touch your heart, and inspire your spirit.